Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is the Jason Stapleton Program, broadcasting one more day live from the Random Walk Studios deep in the heart of America. Now, I must warn you, I have been informed by the head of the Libertarian Party that if you listen to this show, you might not be the LP's target audience. So be careful. If you were looking to align yourself with the Libertarian Party, this might not be the place for you, according to the head of the Libertarian Party. I will, t- I will tell you, my Twitter feed exploded yesterday. Mm-hmm. I had absolutely no idea that it was, it was going to go the way it went. And, uh, and I, I honestly had no idea whether or not I would be chastised for the interview or not. I just knew how I felt. And I knew that I, I wasn't going to let uh, a friend of mine and, and fellow host get railroaded. And so I, I said my piece, and, and Nick said his piece. And, and as I said yesterday, kudos to him for coming on, knowing what he was walking into. And, uh, and I, uh, but overwhelmingly, the support that I've gotten from Twitter has been, and, and Facebook has been positive. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I don't venture out much out of my own little ecosystem because I don't really like social media. I think it's a gigantic waste of time. But I did find myself yesterday getting sucked in because just as I was trying to catch up and read what you guys had wrote, I'd get six or eight more posts. It was, uh, I mean, it really was crazy, and they just keep coming in. So all of you are very opinionated, and it would seem, for the most part, are uh, uh, felt like uh, felt like Nick really needs to, I don't know, needs to not do what he's doing. I don't, <laughs> what he said. They just weren't very happy with Nick. Let's put it that way. But look, uh, you know, Libertarian Party is going to run its run itself the way it wants to and somebody up there at the LP thinks that he's doing a good job and until they think otherwise he's he's going to be in charge and but I I got uh, really good feedback from a lot of people had uh, several people send me notes I just wonder this is what I was wondering and Darren actually brought this up yesterday imagine what would have happened if like the head of the GOP Mm -hmm. Rince Priebus before he went to the White House imagine if he had gone out and attacked uh, Rush Limbaugh Right now, this is, of course, on a smaller scale. GOP's bigger. Rush Limbaugh's much bigger than, than, uh, than somebody like Tom Woods. But imagine, this is just a smaller scale of that. You've got the head of the Libertarian Party attacking who is a guy who is arguably the largest and most uh, powerful radio host for libertarians in the world. Now, how do you think that's going to turn out? It's not if you're going to go out and attack him, he's going to go on, then he's going to show up on Sean Hannity's show and he's going to start, you know, talking smack again. Like he's just going to double down. Yeah. He's just, yeah. He's not going to back off that thing a bit. The last time I heard any Republican badmouth Rush Limbaugh, Mm -hmm. it was so bad, so bad that the politician had to call in and apologize on Rush's show. And Rush doesn't take call-ins, right? He doesn't take calls from politicians. He, of course, let this guy in to to give an apology, (laughs) a public apology on his show. But I, I, I have to walk away. Whether or not you feel like Nick was right or wrong, you can't look at it and say that the, picking that fight was a good thing for the party or a good thing for the libertarian message. There's absolutely no way. I mean, the objective, I'm, I'm not sure what the objective was, unless the objective, because there, Tom has not said anything derogatory or racist or, or anything of the sort. So the, the, Nick is making an inference based on what, what Tom didn't do. And to me, picking that fight, regardless of what you think, seems to be a tactical error in judgment. Yes? No? Yeah, I would agree. All right. So I don't want to relive it, but if you haven't watched the show or listened to the show from yesterday, you should go and check it out because it was a, it was a barn burner, from what I understand. And um, definitely the most, I guess, confrontational interview I've ever done. And I don't uh, personally. I don't. I don't really like doing those kind of interviews. It doesn't. Uh, I don't. I don't enjoy it. And one of the people are asking me, uh, "Why don't you have more progressives on so that you can debate them on your show?" And I. I just don't enjoy it. Uh, hopefully, yesterday, what you came away with was I have no issue doing it. I'm more than capable of defending my position. 
Uh, I'm more than capable of debating someone. I just don't enjoy doing that publicly uh, because it, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't serve our interest. I'm much, it is much better for me to sit here and talk with you today about the ideas of progressivism, like the thousand dollar a month cash handout that they say is going to stimulate the economy by two point five trillion dollars and punch holes all the way through it, rather than try and play rope a dope with some progressive where I got to circle arguments and I got to try and catch them and not let them get away with stuff that's that's much more difficult to do and and to me unless you just like watching car wrecks it is really not a huge benefit to anyone listening so we i have no plans to change the way the show is run but i do appreciate all of you and your support and your emails and if you really want to show your support for uh, Tom Woods and the support for me and, and what we stand for and our frustration with the Libertarian Party, you can call uh, your local party representative and explain your concern. You can pull your funding from the Libertarian Party. This is what I've been telling people in the GOP to do for years. Hey, stop paying them. And when they call you and they want your money and they want your donations, if you're not happy with what your senator or congressman is doing, stop paying the GOP. They'll change. Trust me. They'll get out whoever it is is the problem if you just stop giving them money. So if you're unhappy with the way the Libertarian Party is being run, the answer is stop giving them money. And when the money dries up, guess what will happen? The leadership will change because everything revolves around money. I don't care who you are. I don't care what industry you're in. Everybody's got to eat. You know something Nick said that yesterday too that shocked me. He's, did you hear he said it was a volunteer position? Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. That, that's, that, that's, I don't understand that. All right. So another thing here, if you're out there raising, and according to Nick, raising huge amounts of money, he is as the head of the Libertarian Party, going out and shaking hands, greasing palms, getting the donation dollars in, and they're coming in in the form of $70,000, $100,000, $50,000 lots, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not doing that for free. I don't work for free. I'm a capitalist like anybody else, and I love the party and I love the ideas, but I'm not doing it for free. Why would anybody expect you to do that for free? If you're willing to do it, that's one thing, but to have a position as high as chairman of the Libertarian Party that's unpaid is ridiculous, and that's a six-figure-a-year job. I mean, he ought to be spending all day, every day doing nothing but improving the Libertarian Party, and he ought to be paid accordingly. Um, I can guarantee you if they called me asking for my advice, uh, the, the first hour's free. After that, the bill starts, I mean, the juice starts running, right? <laughs> Ain't nothing free in this world, folks. It's not. I don't ask you to work for free. I never demand that anybody, uh, we have some people on this show just in, in, in uh, total clear, uh, clarity. We do have some people who help with this show who don't get paid. And I don't ask them to do anything. They come to me, they say, can I help? And I say, listen, I would love your help. I can't pay you. I can't afford it. Um, the people that I can't afford to pay uh, and I do make requirements of, they get paid. But everybody else does it out of the goodness of their own heart, and I don't expect it. I don't demand anything of them. And I'm deeply appreciative to all of the people who support this show, both financially and with their time. But the difference is you can't make any demands on somebody who's not being compensated for their time. It's, a, it's one of the reasons I'm so cautious about bringing on volunteers is because I, it's, just, it's, it's very, very difficult to, them, to then make demands of them. Uh, but I just feel like being a position that it is, that you got to be compensated for it. I mean, if he's bringing in two, three, five, 10, 20, 50, $100 million a year into the Libertarian Party, man, a guy ought to be making some money. So anyway, enough said about all of that. Let's move on to news of the day. Headline for today, America has a tax problem, said everybody who ever paid taxes. <laughs> I mean, there's no, that, that's like one of the, it took absolutely no, <laughs> no moxie at all to write that headline. But it comes from an article out of CNS News, uh, BLS, it's a Bureau of Labor and Statistics, says America spends more on taxes than food and clothing combined. Let me read it to you. It says... 
according to the study, that in 2016, Americans did in fact spend more on food and clothing, com uh, or more on taxes than food and clothing combined. It said the same data shows that in a three-year period from 2013 to 2016, the average tax bill for Americans increased by 41.13%. That's out. It's incredible. And you might ask yourself, well, where did the tax increases come from? It actually doesn't even say in this article. I, I ran through it and tried to look for it. But the total, in, the, the difference between what you pay in taxes and what you pay for food and clothing is about 14%. You pay about 14% more in taxes uh, every year on average than you do food and clothing. And the only thing that actually beats taxes was... Um, was household uh, mortgages or rent, what it costs for you to live in your home. That's the only thing that Americans spent more on than taxes. This is why when people say in Washington that we don't have a, uh, a spending problem, we have a tax problem, that there are certain people who just aren't paying enough in taxes, you can look at this and say, no, that's just not true. Because 95% of the people who are paying taxes are paying way too much. And it's increasing at a astronomical rate, 41% over the course of three years. And the, the question that I pose, and the one that I posed in, in, uh, in, in the little blurb that I wrote before the show today, was that, um, is there no limit to the entitlement some in government have over the fruits of your labor? At what point do we consider... Uh, this theft to be unreasonable. <laughs> Some of you might be laughing and saying, all theft is unreasonable, Jason, and you'd be right. All theft is unreasonable. But at what point do we say, no, this is, we have a massive problem here. This isn't a problem with us. It's not that the middle class or the wealthy or the poor aren't paying their fair share. It's the fact that you guys are taking more than what anyone could possibly think was just. And then you have to ask yourself, how long are you going to allow it to continue? It's not in your best interest for the government to confiscate your money. How can they possibly say that it's better, it's better for you that the government confiscate more of your wealth than you pay to feed and clothe your family? That's what this says. You, what do you need to survive? Food, clothing, and shelter. Those are the three things. The government takes more money than two of those three things combined that are required for you to live, to exist. In what world is that acceptable? Apparently in this world, because we have yet to do something to change it. And guys, if you want to change it, it's as simple as showing up. It's as simple as making a deliberate decision to start voting for representatives rather than politicians. Do you understand? Representatives, not politicians. Principle, not party. This is what we should be discussing. And unfortunately, we don't have those conversations often enough, and individuals are not taking enough personal responsibility when it comes to showing up. There are lots of people who are running in Republican races and Libertarian races around the United States this year. Many of them have, have written to me and have talked with me and are sharing with me uh, the commitment that they're making to go and be a representative for their districts, for their states, for their cities and municipalities. The question is, will you support them? Will you come out during the primary and get rid of the schlub working for the GOP who goes to Washington and forgets you exist until election year comes around? Or will you choose to stay at home and watch the game and be like, oh, tonight was election night? Oh, we had primaries tonight? I can't believe it. Where was I, silly me? Well, I'll get it at the general. That's what really matters. No. The primaries are where elections are won or lost. Because we're not talking about which party wins, we're talking about principle. And the principled candidates right now are not in Washington. They're in your hometown. They're in your home district. 
They're trying to figure out how to get into a position to be able to support you and support the principles of liberty that we all propose to support. And the question is, are you going to help them do it or not? Now, yes, you can sit at home and you can not vote and you can not be involved in the, in the process because you think that it, it somehow makes you part of the system. You just make it harder on everybody else. I, I just happen to believe that you should be engaged in the political process. Tom Woods is fond of saying, it doesn't matter who you vote for, you always get John McCain. That's not entirely true. Every once in a while, you get a Thomas Massey. Every once in a while, you get a Ron Paul. And the question is, are we going to go out and look for those guys, and are we going to give them our vote and our time and our attention when the time comes? And yeah, it, we may look stupid. You know, I I uh, I like Austin Peterson. He's a, he and I are have have gotten to know each other well enough that I feel like I know him as a person. And I've supported him, and I said, you know what? I, I hope that you beat Claire McCaskill. I hope that you you get into the Senate, because based on the conversations we've had privately, I think you'd be a good man. Privately, I've also told him, don't make me look foolish. Because it's always a risk when you stick your neck out, especially somebody like me, and you put your faith and you put your support behind someone. And if you feel uncomfortable with that, if you feel like, hey, I can't give my support to anyone for fear that they might hurt me, well, then maybe the right decision is for you to be in the position where you're going to be able to do the right thing. There are a million different ways that you can support the movement. You can support the movement by just being an advocate for the liberty, the liberty principles we talk about on this show. Limited government, individualism, peace, tolerance, and free markets. You can be an advocate by working uh, in behind the scenes in an election with somebody that you really support. You can support them with your financial do- with financially with your money or with your effort. You can be one of the people who runs for political office. Or you can be one of the representatives who joins a party and who seeks to try and fix the party from inside. There, or, last but not least, you could be a lowly podcast host. Someone who shows up every day and tries to be a voice for an idea. The choice is yours. The question is, what are you doing? Because doing nothing really isn't acceptable. Being part of the silent majority is no longer adequate. We need warriors. We really do. We need people who are willing to stand up and put their reputation to put their opinions on the line. I mean, we've got, I got an article in, this, in the stack here today about Google, and Google is, a, is attacking a, a website now and saying, hey, if you don't remove this content that we think is offensive, uh, we're no longer going to allow you to advertise or ex- receive advertising revenue on your website. Now, guys, Google is completely free to do that. They, ha- they have the right. It's, it's their company. But think about what that means. Think about where we're going now. Now we're in a position where this private company is playing the role of social advocate. Instead of making decisions based purely off what is financially beneficial for them, they're doing what they feel is right um, uh, uh, with, uh, with regard to society. It's going to make it harder and harder as those companies get bigger and bigger. Apple could do the same thing. The next thing you know, I could be getting a call uh, from one of the big companies like YouTube that says, hey, Jason, unless you change the way you talk about liberty and the way you talk about progressives, we're not even going to allow you to have a channel on our website. Completely within their right to do. Now we're going to be looking for that next opportunity. Where do we go from there if YouTube shuts us down? Where's the next entrepreneur who's starting up the next site that's going to be independent? Who's going to allow free speech to happen? You see, you could be that person. But being silent isn't an option. If you're being silent, you're you're counterproductive to the work that we're trying to do. 
We're going to need an army of people who are willing to do what's necessary to spread the message of liberty. And the great thing is, guys, this is what I always say, is that in the arena of ideas, we cannot be defeated. We can't be. We're right. Our principles are just. Our economics are sound. All you have to do is sell it. And if you're not comfortable doing it, all you got to do is show up here. And I'll tell you, I'll explain it to you. And then the second thing you got to do is if you don't feel comfortable going out, just send them here. Be an advocate for this show and say, hey, you should go and listen to Jason's show. I'll do my best not to be too pompous or arrogant, at least for a couple episodes. No, no promises. No promises. <laughs> it's hard. It's so hard, Darren. <laughs> but anyway, I, I just feel like I, I just feel like it's uh, we were talking yesterday so much about uh, Nick was talking so much about how all people who aren't in the party just sit and snipe from the sidelines. I want you all to know none of you are on the sidelines. None of you. We are all players in this game, whether you want to be or not. You're either the guy who's letting the play happen and letting the other team score on you, or you're one of the guys in the fight. You're one of the guys in the hustle. So be one of those guys. All right. Guys, it's tough to it's tough to get meals done. I know how busy it is. I got a sick kid at home right now. My wife and I were up all night, and dinner time rolls around, and everybody's throwing up their hands like, what are we going to do? And, of course, the next thing you do is you're like, well, let's order a pizza, and we'll wait 45 minutes for it to be delivered. But what if you had all of the stuff that you needed to make a delicious home-cooked meal already there? And what if you could create that meal in under an hour? That's what Blue Apron is, guys. It's the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home-cooked meals accessible to everyone. They've established a partnership with 150 local farms, fisheries, ranchers across the United States, and they get great beef, chicken, pork, seafood, produce, all from farms that practice regenerative farming. Because Blue Apron ships uh, the exact amount of each ingredient required to the recipe, they reduce food waste. And what happens is they send you this box, got all the stuff in it that you need to make a delicious home-cooked meal. They got the recipe right there. All you got to do is literally put it together, and you can get it together and have a meal on the table in not much longer than it takes for the pizza to get delivered. So Blue Apron knows how busy you are, and they're offering 30-minute meals. The meals are made with the same flavor and farm fresh ingredients that you know and love and are ready in 30 minutes or less. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping. Go to blueapron.com forward slash Stapleton. That's blueapron.com forward slash Stapleton. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Guys, I've tried it. It's delicious. You need to try it too. All right. So we got a $1,000 per month cash handout that would apparently grow the economy by $2.5 trillion, new study says. That's the headline from CNBC. Now, what have I told you about headlines? You got to be careful because headlines are typically deceptive. What it says in the headline is oftentimes not the way the article reads. So headline from CNN, a $1,000 per month cash handout would grow the economy by $2.5 trillion. Huh. Giving away money? makes the economy grow. That's interesting. And if I'm a normal, normal adult, I just read the headline and go on. It says, given that every adult, giving every adult in the United States a $1,000 cash handout would month, per month would grow the economy by $2.5 trillion by 2025. This is a report released by the Roosevelt Institute. Now, the Roosevelt Institute is a left-wing institute, think tank. And what they did was the study made economic forecasts from three proposals. First, a full universal income where everyone gets $1,000 per month, uh, a partial basic income where everyone gets $500 a month, and a child allowance, which gives everybody about $250 per month. And they said, well, let's test all of these and let's see what kind of effect we get on the economy if we give out these different sources of revenue. And the largest universal basic income, the greatest benefit to, created the greatest benefit to the economy. So if we give people $1,000, that has greater effect than if we gave them $250. I don't know what we paid for this study, but I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. I mean, who knew that just dumping money into, a, into an economy would increase spending and consumption? Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe it. 
especially giving it to the poorest among us who feel like they don't have a lot of money to begin with. This, of course, is going to increase radically their spending cap capabilities and no doubt going to raise them up out of poverty, give them the, what they need to get out there and get to work. The question is, how exactly are they getting the money? Because if they're taking it from somebody else, didn't you just deprive someone else of $1,000? Didn't you just borrowing from Peter to pay Paul? And if you tax it, aren't you in the essence doing exactly the same thing, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul? And if you print the money, aren't you simply borrowing money from future generations who have yet to be born, thus burdening them with excessive debt that they are going to have to pay off, reducing the standard of living of those in the future? Well, it turns out that the study actually went into that. It says, these estimates are based on a universal basic income paid for with an increase in the federal deficit. As part of the study, the researchers also calculated the effect of the economy if you paid the cash handouts off by increasing taxes. In that case, there would be no net benefit to the economy, the report finds. Go figure. You see, if you borrow from Peter to pay Paul, you don't see any economic benefit from that. In fact, what you really get is a negative economic benefit because it de-incentivizes one guy to work, and it also de-incentivizes another guy to work. So you've, got, you've created disincentives on both sides because the guy who's getting paid now doesn't have to go out and earn that money anymore. He can sit at home and just collect it. And the guy who's been taken from, you just de-incentivized him from working to create the $1,000 that then gets shuffled off to guy B. So there's all kinds of very negative benefits when you do that kind of uh, wealth transfer. But that's not what they're talking about. No, what they're talking about is simply printing money and pumping it into the economy. Well, of course it's going to increase GDP. I mean, I don't know what you guys know about the uh, velocity of money, but guys, you put more dollars into circulation, not only are you going to increase inflation, but you're also going to increase the number, of, uh, you're also going to increase GDP. It's a false increase because most of it is coming from inflation, but you are going to get some consumer buying. But all that extra consumer buying leads to what? Increased prices. We've been talking about supply and demand this week with all the stuff going on down in Texas. If you've got an increased supply of cash and a limited amount of goods, what happens to the price of those goods? They go up. This is the problem. And what's even funnier, in the very next paragraph, CNBC quotes the study. It says, when paying for the policy by increasing taxes on households rather than paying for the policy with debt, the policy is not expansionary, doesn't work. The report says, in effect, it is giving to households with one hand and then taking it away with the other. There is no net effect. And guys, what they are saying in this study from the Roosevelt Institute is that every single economic argument in favor of wealth transfer doesn't work. They just debunked all of their own studies by saying, listen, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. You can't stand in a bucket and try and lift yourself up by the handle. That doesn't work. You can't create economic expansion by taxing one person into submission in order to raise another person out of poverty. But in truth, you see, that's not really what they want. So you think about the minimum wage. This isn't about actually increasing everyone's standard of living. That's what you have to understand. If that's what it was about, then the argument would be finished. No, this is about wealth inequality. This is about those who have a great deal of money being punished for the wealth that they have amassed. And that money being transferred to those who have very little in order to narrow the disparity of wealth. Now, what that creates is a lower standard of living for everyone, but people who work in Washington, people who work in think tanks at the Roosevelt Institute don't care about that. They care about equality over opportunity. They care about equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. This is what they argue for. This is what they fight for.
So they don't care if the millionaire or the guy making $250,000 a year all of a sudden now makes 100000 as long as the guy making forty now makes sixty, or the guy making twenty now makes forty. That's what he wants to see happen. Everybody a little more equally miserable. And what we know from capitalism is that two things happen. Number one is that when markets are free, and when people are free to pursue their own self-interest and they're allowed to keep what they make, that there is income inequality. It happens as a natural byproduct. But we also know from this same process that even our poor are better off than the richest among those who live under different economic models. Does that make sense? It means even the poor in America live better than the rich in socialist countries. A man can be called wealthy in some parts of the world and not have half of what the poorest among Americans have. That's the important thing for you to remember. There is no better model than the capitalist economic system. None. That is undisputable. When we talk about these ideas, that's what I'm saying. That is an undisputable fact. There is no better model. Hasn't been invented. Everything else is some form or version of socialism, communism, fascism, where the state controls, where nobody controls from each according to their need to each, or from each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's, an, it's a dead argument. The ideas have been tried. They are failures. The only system of government, or the only system, economic system that has ever been able to lift people out of poverty is the capitalist system. As Walter Williams said, it's also the only system where you can become wealthy by helping your neighbor. Zig Ziglar said you can get everything that you want out of this life if you can figure out how to give other people what they want. In a nutshell, that's selling. I talk about what I do, and I say I get to help people make their dreams come true. That's, that's what my job is. People pay me to help them change their lives. If I didn't do a good job of it, I wouldn't be where I am. My job is to help people achieve a life and a lifestyle that they've always wanted. The only way I'm able to do that is by actually benefiting others. That's the capitalist system. You don't need a $1,000 per month handout in order to help lift people out of poverty. What you have to do is you have to set an expectation of personal responsibility, and you have to create an environment where it's easy for them to start, grow, or be hired in a business. If you do those things, there's absolutely no limit to what a man or woman can accomplish in this country. The limitations that people now feel or are, are, are in front of them are either fabricated, they're, they're, they're not there, they're just assumed to be there, or they're created by government in cooperation with, on many occasions, companies. In the absence of government coercion and crony capitalism, the economic system of capitalism works best. So anyway, I hope that not only explains away this idea of a basic income and also helps give you some hope that, hey, you know, you, you can change your stars. You know, stop telling yourself you, you, you're too young or you're too old, you're too fat, you're too ugly, whatever, to make the change and start doing some things in your life that are going to get you where you want to go. Now, one of the things that you can do is take a couple of spare minutes and do a little bit of reading. But you got a lot of stuff to do. You got like six meetings, you got 200 emails in your inbox, you got 72 books you already told yourself you're going to read, just a stack of them sitting in your home that you haven't had time to get to. So what can you do with like 15 minutes, right? Well, that's where Blinkist comes in. Blinkist is a fantastic site that has taken over 2,000 of the best-selling nonfiction books and transferred them into powerful packs that you can read and listen to in just 15 minutes. So they've taken the books, they've consolidated them down into a, a, a couple of pages that you can read in about 15 minutes, gives you an overview of the entire book. 
So if you're looking to increase your uh, your store of knowledge and skills, this is one of the best ways to do it because it doesn't cost you any money. I've tried this service. I love it. It absolutely is great. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer for just my audiences. Go to Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton right now to start your free trial or you can get three months off your yearly plan. And I'm telling you, the yearly plan is nothing. It's so cheap. So you can either get a free trial or three months off your yearly plan. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton to start your free trial and get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton. One of the things I use this uh, service for, just so you know, is I like to, a lot of times I'll listen to an audio book, and then if I really like the book, I will buy the book so I can go and rip pages out of it and highlight stuff. I've got just folders at my house of stuff that I think is really cool or interesting stuff that I want to use in, in some sort of uh, program that I'm building or some sort of you know idea that I have. And I will just rip the pages, highlight what I want and rip the pages out and put them into file folders. And so, but one of the things that I never know is, well, do I really want to waste time trying to listen to this entire book? Or maybe I need to read the, read the overview. And then when I realize that it's something I want, I should just buy the book rather than the audio book and then the book. Well, I started going to Blinkist and started reading the 15 or so or 20 pages of, of manuscript that they put together. And I could decide instantly whether it's a book I really wanted. So it saves me not only a ton of time, but a lot of money too, because I read a lot. And so that's one of the ways that I'm using it that I think might benefit you too. So go and check them out. Now, one of the things that we have been talking about in uh, the last few months is this idea that the stock market keeps going up and up and up, not because the economy is healthy, but because central banks are buying. And I've tried to point out that the Swiss National Bank has been buying, that likely the other national uh, central banks have been buying, and what they're doing is they're simply printing money and then taking that money and buying equities with it, buying U.S. equities, buying foreign equities, buying foreign bonds, all kinds of stuff, anywhere they can go. And the reason they're doing that is because they can't get yield anywhere else. Now, anybody who doesn't understand what yield is, yield is just a return. So if you think if you put $100 into the stock market this year and at the end of the year it grows by 10%, that gives you $110 at the end of the year. You just received a 10% yield on that $100. Yield is commonly used in, in bonds to talk about how much a bond is worth. It's a, it's a yields 3.5% for 30 years, you know, something like that. And so when I talk about yield and central banks not being able to get yield, what I mean is they can't get a return. And why? Because interest rates are below zero. They can't get loans. They can't offer loans out at negative interest rates or at interest rates that are, say, at a quarter percent or a half percent and hope to be able to fund their operations. They need interest rates to be higher. But central banks are holding interest rates down. So what do they do? Well, for the longest time, they've just been stuck because the only people who could get around it were actual central banks. And that's the article where the article, the article here in Zero Hedge picks up. They say it turns out it used to be that just the Bank of Japan had the implicit green light to allocate funds to equities. Translation, it used to be just the Japanese central bank could buy equities with the money they had. But that is no longer the case. According to Bloomberg, Japan's second largest commercial bank Japan Post Bank Company, this is a private bank, has decided to follow in the footsteps of its giant peers and plans to, quote, plow 100 billion yen or $904 million directly into buying stock, quote, when it finds the right opportunities. Unable, this is the important point, unable to generate required returns through conventional means such as lending, Japan's second largest bank by deposits, which currently invests in equities only through passive investments in funds, plans to become a giant prop trading hedge fund and aims to boost active stock holdings to 700 billion yen in the next five to 10 years. Now, that's going to be somewhere around six million or six billion dollars i think if i do my math right on that somewhere around six billion dollars here's the problem with that this is a regular retail bank that that up until now has gotten its money 
from conventional banking, meaning making loans to people who, had, who, who were reliable and who had a, a good chance of paying their debt back. They are now venturing into private equity. They're venturing into prop trading, proprietary trading. This is hedge fund type stuff. The danger with this is they are playing that game with your money. Does that make sense? See, normally you would know whether you were putting your money into high-risk assets like proprietary trading firms that use algorithms and computers in order to try and generate above-average returns. And you would use that as an investment. But the money that you're putting in your bank account, that's not what that money's for, is it? No, that money's to make your car payment, to pay your rent, to, to take care of your kids when they get sick. That money's not there to be gambled with in the stock market. But that's what the bank is going to do with that money. And they're going to do it because they don't have any choice, because the central banks have held interest rates so low for so long that they can't make any money. You should be very, very cautious of what your bank is doing, because you're going to see a lot of these banks doing the same thing. And when the market turns, when it finally turns, it will be catastrophic, not just for the financial sector, but the banking sector will crumble as well. Why? Because all of their money is locked up in equities. It's well, dangerous. Then the stock market just becomes too big to fail. Listen, that's a very valid point, and I was going to make the point today, is that I think that this entire economy right now is a complete sham, mm -hmm. but there's no way I'm getting short. Yeah. There's no way. I, I'm, I'm, I might not be fully invested, but there's no way I'm getting short. I don't feel like. I don't think the central bank, the treasury, would sit around and allow for a, a 25, 30% correction. I think they would step in before that. Look, man, how can, listen, how can you be short in this market when you've yeah. got central banks that have unlimited resources who are buying and pumping money into the market? You mm -hmm. now have conventional banks that can't get yield, so they're, they're buying the into the stock thing. market. Who on earth would be short? Mm -hmm. Now, you got people pulling money out left and right. They don't yeah. want to be involved because they're just like, dude, they smell a rat. Mm -hmm. But they know, nobody's going to get on the short side of this. Why? How, it's like stepping in front of a freight train. You can't put your hand up and stop that thing from coming. It's going to run over you. So I don't know. But dude, we could have a 10% corre correction any day. Yeah. Any day. But I think over the, uh, over the long term, until banking policy changes or until we see a complete and total meltdown, w this market's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. It's just not. So anyway, you know, at your, at your own risk, folks, at your own risk. All right, guys, let me tell you about Breather. I know we got some lunch extra ads. I've been gone a lot, and, you know, so I'm, I'm sorry if we're doing some extra reads. But, you know, suck it up. Hit the fast-forward button if you have to. But, guys, what do you do if you own a small business and you're trying to get started and you got this big company that wants to talk with you? You want to close that big deal. It's really going to change things for your company. But you don't want to bring them to your garage because – then you look tiny and you want to look big and you want to look like you can handle all the orders, even though you need, you need them to buy it first so that you can get the receipt so you can take it to the bank and borrow the money that you need to actually create the product that you're going to give to them, right? It's surprising how often that works, but you, you need, everybody's seen Shark Tank, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you need the orders. Once you got the orders, you can get the money. So what do you do? Well, it's incredibly frustrating. Where do you go? Well, you want to look professional. You want to have Wi-Fi. You, if you're working for a larger company and you're at a, at a site somewhere, you want to make sure that the boss approves. Well, well get, Breather is a solution. Beautiful, inspiring workplaces for your off-site team, meetings, client meetings, even individual work. And the best part, you only pay for the time that you need, uh, a month, a day, or even just an hour. Now, Breather has locations in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Palo Alto, Boston, Chicago, D.C., Toronto, Montreal, London, and they're growing. Try Breather right now, and you'll receive $100 off your first booking when you go to breather.com forward slash Stapleton. That's $100 off your first booking when you go to breather.com forward slash Stapleton. Breather.com forward slash Stapleton. Do it now. All right. That was the last one, I promise. Here's an interesting one. Uh, people are really upset about this, and uh, frankly, I don't understand why. Southern Poverty Law Center. 
Now, this is the the group that was most famously known for not having me on it as a hate group, mm. right? Because Chris Ann Hall got on there, right. but then not me. Mm-hmm. I'm working it. Somebody needs to share the show with them. But they're, the Southern Poverty Law Center is the decider of who's a hate group and who isn't. And they're the de facto decider because the media says that they are. When, in fact, they're really just a left-wing organization that picks on right-wing organizations and calls them hate groups. Um, they list uh, conservative organizations alongside racist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan and often uh, are referenced in the media. Now, the Southern Poverty Law Center has turned into a fundraising powerhouse, if you can believe that. Records uh, recording more than 50 million in contributions and 328 million in net assets in 2015. That's a lot of money. That's in 2015. You can imagine what's happened over the last couple of years. Well, it turns out they've partnered with a group called Tiger Global Management out of New York City. And the two of them have decided that they're going to get into the investment business in the Cayman Islands. And they have been shuffling money out of the United States into the Caymans. First, a transfer of $960,000 on November 24th of 2014, then $2.2 million in 2015, and another $2.2 million later on that year uh, to some company called AQR Style Prima Offshore Fund. And what they are doing, just I, I can read you the whole article and they can talk about how, ne- how nefarious this all is, but it's really not. What you've got is you've got a you've got the Southern Poverty Law Center that's been able to raise a truckload of money, and they want to make sure that a hundred years from now they're able to live off that money. So how do you do it? Well, you certainly don't want to have to pay taxes on the money that you invest, and so what you do is you take the money that you've already been taxed on because they've been taxed on it once when they got the donation. Actually, they're five hundred three C, so they don't they don't get taxed on that money. They offshore that money into the Cayman Islands. They invest it, and that investment money grows tax-free. And then they can use it in all kinds of different ways, tax-free, if they're careful. This evades forever the necessity to ever pay taxes on that money. Now, you might say to yourself, Southern Poverty Law Center, this this wild left-wing group, wouldn't they want to be paying taxes? Don't they feel it's their obligation? To pay them? I mean, they've been so successful at raising this money, and then they go and they use the money that somebody else gave them. It was a gift. And they invest that money, and they make even more money with it. Don't, shouldn't they be forced to pay taxes on that money? Well, of course, as a libertarian, I say, no, they should not. Leave them alone. Let them leave their money in, the, in, the, in America. Stop sticking your hand in your pocket like it's your money. It's not. If they're able to go and take that money and multiply it, let them. Just let me do it too. Yeah, just let me do it too. (laughs) The point I'm making is, is that while they will criticize at every turn Wall Street, the greedy rich, the wealthy elitists, they in turn are using the same tax loopholes, the same investment strategies that those rich 1% are using. They're not above the fray. They're right down in it, man. They're absolutely willing to avoid paying taxes, you know, if it benefits them. See, it doesn't matter who you are, guys. Everybody's looking out for their own self-interest. Even the people who say that they're looking out for you, ultimately, they're looking out for themselves. That's why you need to make sure that it is always your politician's best interest to be working for your best interest. That is one thing, just like the politician who had to call up and apologize publicly on Rush Limbaugh's show, that's a man who understood he'd gotten away from what was in his own best interest, and he had to go and make amends. I don't know if Nick will realize ever what's in his best interest and what's in his party's best interest, but I can guarantee you It's not attacking Tom Woods, and it's certainly not coming on my show and trying to defend himself. But the better you understand that everybody is looking out for their own best interest, what you'll you'll come to understand is, listen, it's not selfish of me to pursue my own self-interest. Because if I am doing a good job of that, I'm going to be helping other people in the process. And therefore, 
following your own self-interest, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You should embrace it. You should embrace it when other people do it and understand that there are times when we will cooperate and there are times that we can compete. But in the arena of ideas, we simply can't be defeated. Guys, thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for spreading the message. Thank you for everything that you do and everything that you are. I will be back here on Monday. We will do this all over again. Until then, be safe, be good. I'll talk to you then.